On this beautiful Mother's Day, I can't help but think back over the many amazements of raising children. The things you never thought you'd say, like, we don't lick the cat. <laughs> the things you never thought to teach them, like, we don't practice our scissor skills on the patio window screens. The things you never dreamt you'd see, like an entire kitchen floor covered in sugar art. The things you never imagined needing to do, like trying to disgorge a full two pound box of cooked macaroni from the pipes underneath the kitchen sink because your daughter thought the garbage disposal was something akin to a magic portal of disappearance. <laughs> the skills you never dreamt they'd have, like when your three-year-old picks a bedroom doorknob lock with his sister's barrette. Has one of your children ever caught you in the act? You know, caught you in that most intimate of moments? One where you were perhaps in an embarrassing or even a submissive position? One where the fullness of your passion was on display and your heart was wide open and you were fully vulnerable? What I mean is, has one of your children ever caught you on your knees pouring your heart out to God in audible prayer? Now, I'm not talking about being caught in a dignified, formal prayer, like quietly bowing your head over a meal, or perhaps reciting a prayer at bedtime. And while those prayers are important, and they should be regularly heard and seen, what I'm talking about is, have you ever been caught in that intimate moment of crying out to God, perhaps in joy for some kind of wondrous blessing, or perhaps in need, beseeching him for something that was most pressing on your heart? Maybe you were even desperately praying for the very one who caught you in the act. Coming to this place, both before and with God, coming to this place of surrender, is not something we typically put on public display. This is not a state of being we demonstrate in, say, public restaurants or even before things like church council meetings or other gatherings. This is a place of personal relationship, and it is very private treasured and sacred. So when, stump, when someone stumbles in on us in these moments, it can be, well, it's usually annoying because we've been interrupted. But it's also embarrassing, like being caught physically naked. And it makes sense. We're often embarrassed when our bodies are seen naked. But here, in this sort of prayer, it's not our bodies that are naked. It's our very souls. And this bearing of our souls is even more embarrassing because while our physical bodies have their various bumps and marks and all those sorts of things that humble us, our souls, well, they have their own embarrassing oddities and deformities too. Our souls carry the full darkness of our sin and our shame. Things that we ourselves shudder to look at and can't even bear to fully see. Yet here, in these kinds of prayers, we're utterly soul naked before God and whoever else might happen to walk in. It's also in a very sense, much like getting caught making love. There is the intimacy and the vulnerability and the nakedness of our hearts and our souls as God meets us and responds both to us and to our prayers. And that complete openness only deepens as we continue in prayer, responding back to whatever God has spoken to our hearts in those moments. Even more than physical mating, prayer is the most intimate act that a human being can ever experience. So, has one of your children or anyone else ever caught you praying like that? Chances are it would be good if they did. If you've ever tried to explain faith in words, it's likely that you've come up short. After all, it's hard to adequately describe something that you have to experience before you can really understand it. And this is the very same problem that we see being worked out in today's Gospel text. In today's reading, Jesus and the disciples are still gathered in the upper room. Jesus knows that his final hours have come, 
His crucifixion is just nine hours away, and his time with the disciples is even shorter than that. So here in this room, Jesus has been spending these last hours reminding the disciples of the things that are most critical and most crucial for them to remember in all of the trials and tribulations that they're about to face. Here we see Jesus doing everything he can to prepare his beloved students for continuing on in life and in ministry without his physical presence. And the lessons are hard. And the disciples are confused and they're very anxious. They've come to rely on Jesus being with them in a concrete, physical sense. They can't yet comprehend what it means that a comforter will be with them to help them. And, and frankly, they don't really care. They don't want a comforter. They want Jesus. They want and need that closeness and connection that only walking beside him can provide. But Jesus is trying to tell them that they're setting their sights far too low and that, as usual, what God has for them is so, so much more than they could ever imagine. But the disciples just aren't getting it. You see, throughout the Upper Room Discourse, Jesus has been trying to explain to the disciples how they will continue to abide in him and how, how he will continue to abide in them, even though they won't be able to see him. He's been trying to tell them how they will all still be one, even after he's no longer physically present with them. Jesus is trying to explain faith. But the disciples just don't get it. The disciples have been believing because they have been seeing. Jesus has been right there. They've been able to see him constantly. But as we know, faith is about believing even when you can't see. Just a few paragraphs before today's reading, the disciples exclaimed to Jesus, now you're speaking plainly. Now we understand what you mean. But Jesus responds with, do you now believe? Which is pretty much Jesus' way of saying, really? The disciples aren't picking up what he's laying down, and Jesus knows it. So what's a Messiah to do? Time is short, and as usual, the humans are broken and feeble. And Jesus knows that unless they can see, they will fail to believe. So Jesus decides not to tell them, but to show them instead. And so he does the only thing that makes sense. He lifts his head and his eyes in prayer to God. Jesus turns to his Father in heaven, and he prays. He prays first for himself, exposing the deepest needs and desires of his heart. And then he prays for the disciples, out loud, right in front of them. And though we read these words today in somewhat formal and distant language, the words from Jesus' lips are anything but cold or formal or distant. Now, these words are incredibly personal and powerful and intimate. Jesus is slicing himself open right in front of his disciples. Have you ever noticed that before? Have you ever noticed the powerful, jaw-dropping intimacy of this prayer? This prayer is known as the High Priestly Prayer, and it's the longest and the most intimate of Jesus' prayers recorded in the New Testament. Now, the duty of a priest was to stand before God as a representative of the people, and then to stand before the people as a representative or a spokesperson for God. The priest was the go-between. This prayer is called the High Priestly Prayer because here, as the perfect priest, Jesus stands in the gap between God and man. But because he is both God and man, Jesus doesn't just shuttle information between the two, but instead he bridges the gap completely. Jesus is not just another priest. Jesus is not simply a holy man whose words describe God. Rather, Jesus makes God present, both by his speaking of words and by his being the word of God himself. He's the same word that calms the sea. He's the same word that raises the dead. He is the same word that forgives sin. This is what it means that Jesus is the word of God. So Jesus doesn't just once again tell the disciples that he is the Messiah, 
the perfect bridge between God and man. Instead, he shows them by bearing his very soul to God the Father and giving the disciples front row seats to the action. Here is the height of his kenosis, the height of his emptying of his own self for the sake of another. Jesus is laying open his heart in communion with the Father, and he does it all for the disciples to see. Jesus stands before the Father, the one who is completely united with every molecule of his being, and says, essentially, Father, I have done your will. I have taken these people you gave me, and I've given them your word. I've given them myself. And they have accepted it and known it, and now it's in their hearts. Now they know the truth. They know that I came from you, and that everything I have is from you. Everything I am and everything I have is from you. Jesus is saying before the disciples that he is entirely shot through with God and that everything he has done, everything he has accomplished, all of the teachings, all of the miracles are God's and God's alone. Jesus is saying that all of it is only because he is God incarnate. He is God joined, united, incorporated into human flesh. That God is incarnate here in him. Now this union is beyond our fathoming, how Christ is both fully human and fully divine, all at the very same time. And it is precisely because of our inability to understand this, that Jesus is instead showing the disciples what this looks like hoping that they might begin to understand. Jesus is showing them that although the Father is not visibly, physically present with him, yet there is no separation between Jesus and the Father. None at all. And so the Father is physically present after all, in him. Jesus continues praying, I am leaving the world and coming to you, Father, and these disciples I'm leaving behind. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given to me, that they may be one, even as we are one. Keep them in your name, that they may be one, even as we are one. Jesus not only allows the disciples to witness this incredible, vulnerable moment of his complete communion with God the Father, but he then prays to God the Father that his disciples would become one, excuse me, both with each other and with him, just as Jesus himself is one with the Father. Jesus is praying that the disciples would know this complete unity and intimacy with the Father that he himself both knows and embodies. In one of his final acts with his beloved disciples, Jesus models what a relationship with God the Father should look like. He shows them how he lays his whole heart and soul wide open, bearing himself humbly and completely before the Father. He's teaching them by example, showing them where words alone have been insufficient. And in doing this, in stripping his soul naked before God in front of his disciples, Jesus, the ever-perfect priest, carries his disciples right into that sacred union. By uttering the words to the Father before the disciples, by exposing his heart and soul, by showing how Jesus and the Father are united as one, Jesus makes the disciples one with each other in the experience and one with him. And in being one with him, they're of course also now united with God the Father. Jesus, the word of God, in speaking and in acting, creates the reality which he proclaims. And why does Jesus do this? Well, he tells us. First, he does it so that the disciples might have Jesus' joy fulfilled in themselves. And second, so that the disciples would be sanctified, <clears throat> consecrated in truth, that they would be steeped in the very truth that God the Father and Jesus will be both united with them and alive in them, even after the crucifixion, even after Christ's ascension. The joy Jesus is talking about comes from the truth that those who believe in him and in all that he has taught them, are truly united with him and with the Father, and that nothing, absolutely 
Nothing can steal that joy from them. Not even those who will stone them, or beat them, or scourge them, or even crucify them for the sake of their faith. No evil, no darkness of this world will ever prevail against them. For it's Christ himself who lives in them and through them. For they are united as one with Jesus Christ. Jesus is showing them that though he will no longer be physically beside them, he'll in fact be closer to them than he ever has been before. He'll no longer merely be beside them, but he will be present within them instead. And with Jesus within them, all that he has is theirs for the asking. And the same is true for you. Here, today, Jesus' words have not passed out of existence or vanished into history. They remain. They are true, and they are living, and they are active, and they are alive for you. Right here, right now, today. Jesus emptied himself in spirit in his prayers and bodily on the cross, so that even right now today, through him and with him as your perfect priest, you would come to know the unsurpassable joy of unity with God. Jesus Christ lives in you and through you. And because of this, all that he has and all that he is, is yours for the asking. And just as with the first century disciples, this truly is more than you can ever ask or think. And yet, God commands you to ask. He invites you to ask. He almost begs you to ask. Ask, he says, come to me, bring to me everything that's burdened me in your heart. I'm your father and I love you and I will hear you. How do you ask? Well, you ask in prayer. You ask in that same intimacy that Jesus modeled for the disciples. You quiet yourself, you lift your eyes heavenward, and you pour out your very soul. In the high priestly prayer, Jesus modeled prayer and unity and connection with God that results in a strength and a joy that overcomes the powers of darkness. Where words alone would not do, Jesus demonstrated the joy of abiding in the Father. And now, Jesus abides in you and fills you with that very same joy and with all of his eternal life. But he doesn't fill you with this joy to keep it to yourself. No, Jesus didn't pray for his disciples to be removed from this, from this treacherous world. And that's because God has a different and a better plan. Jesus fills you with his life and joy, and then he sends you out into the world to share his presence within you with everyone you meet. Jesus sends you out so that you can invite others in. So who in your life needs to be invited in? Who just doesn't understand what faith is and what, and what abiding in Jesus is really all about? Who in your life needs to be shown rather than just told? Who needs to see the depth and the power and the intimacy of this relationship and the strength and the joy that radiate from it? Maybe it's a child or a grandchild. Maybe it's a spouse or a friend or a neighbor. For whom are you willing to lay down your pride? For whom are you willing to be caught in the act? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, make us willing to be willing and keep us always abiding in your spirit, in your truth and in your love. And give us the strength and the courage to share these with those who you have sent into our lives and into our paths. Lord, make us willing to be caught in communion with you. We pray this in your name, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Please rise now for our hymn of the day, number 182. Rise, O children of...